Nasty in here with me. This ain't a diss song, but um, yeah, uh huh, you know what it is. I'm a cheesehead, y'all niggas cheese whiz. Pittsburgh Steelers, that's nothing. That Super Bowl ring, that's nothing. Yeah. Pull up in your town when you see me, you know everything. Green and yellow, green and yellow, green and yellow, green and yellow. Yeah. I put it down, representing for my team. I'm in green. Hi everyone, welcome to Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford sitting next to my partner in crime, Wes Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. Wes, it is Friday, our final show of the week, and that means keys to victory day. Packers Chargers, Sunday, out in Los Angeles. Where do you start with this one? What will it take for the Packers to come back to Green Bay 8-1? and one. Uh, Taking care of business. Uh, that's been my mentality this entire week, I think, for this team and where this all shuffles out for them. Uh, they have done so many different things well situationally that certainly you need those things to line up again uh, if this ends up being a close ball game, as I still anticipate it will be. I do too. But the thing about Green Bay that separated them from being, you know, at this point of the season – you know, sitting where they are and then the Chargers being in the position they are with five losses already is that Packers have executed so much better with the situational things, whether it's the four-minute offense to close out games, whether it's their 15, you know, first scripted plays to start games. Uh, third down, situationally, they've been excellent this year. It's been an area that's plagued them in the past. The biggest key, I think, for Green Bay is going to be if you can have enough, stitch enough of those things together and then, by the way, if you get Devontae Adams back, the element that that offers to this, you know, to this offense and a challenge to the Chargers' defense, I think, really could be a, a thing that tips the scales. Yeah, I think the Packers, for all the talk about how it's going to be a pro Packers crowd and it'll, you know, won't really be like a true road game and all that kind of stuff. I think the Packers have to be ready for another one of those punches in the mouth like they yeah. got from Kansas City last week because this is a Chargers team. They were 2-5. and five. They, were on, they were on the brink. If Eddie Pinero's kick goes through at Soldier Field last week, the Chargers' season almost for all intents and purposes is, is over at 2-6 and six at the halfway point. They got a reprieve. They know it, and this is a this is a good team that made a really strong second half run last year. I expect them to give the Packers absolutely everything they can handle because they're still in this thing, and they know if they get to four and five with seven games to go, as up and down as a lot of teams are in the AFC right now, aside from the New England Patriots, I think the Chargers are going to feel like they're right in it. And uh, in a lot of ways, the Packers have to do what they did last week against Kansas City, which is when that momentum starts to turn the other way, because I think there's going to be a stretch in this game right. when it will, the Packers need to limit the damage. And I thought last week stopping that Kansas City drive right at the end of the first half and making them kick a field goal so it was only 17-14 at halftime instead of 21-14 to after the Packers were up 14 nothing early. I thought that was starting to turn things back in the other direction, and the Packers are going to need a couple of moments like that, I think, in this game on Sunday to uh, withstand or at least limit a surge from the Chargers. Yeah, the Chargers are the most dangerous type of 3-5 and five team that you're going to face because they can basically play to anybody's level. And you've seen that, you know, they can obviously play down to the competition, but they can play up to it as well. And, you know, Phillip Rivers has been through so many of these things over the years. The thing that does stand out to me, though, Mike, if you look at it, the games in which Rivers has turned over the football have been mostly the games where the Chargers have not prevailed. That game against Detroit... 73 passer rating, they lose 13 to 10. The loss to Denver, which was a demoralizing one, 20 yeah. to 13, a 58.6 passer rating, two interceptions in that ball game. Pittsburgh the following week, two more interceptions, 77.8. When he's been on, they've had a chance. When he's been off, it, it, it's it's hurt them. But with Phillip Rivers playing the way he does and the structure of this offense is that he can still go off at any time. 
I mentioned Insider Inbox. I look at him and Keenan Allen as one of the top quarterback-receiver combos in this league right now. And for that reason is why I think, yeah, if there's going to be some series, if there's going to be some drives that they end up you know, putting together, you know, lengthy eight, nine plays, they move the ball, you have to be able to stay stout in the red zone. And the Packers have been terrific in that way this season. So there, there's going to be those adverse moments. And even if it is a pro Packers crowd inside, you know, the stadium, 30,000 seats or whatever, most of it on top of the field, you still have to be ready to rally. You still have to be ready to cut it out. And I think one thing that the 7-1 start has taught the Packers, and Tremont Williams was discussing it in the locker room this week, is when you find ways to win like this mm-hmm. and you keep you know, getting those Ws in your, your win column, that's what's going to propel you into the second half of a season because you've been there before many times and then some. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely because as we talked about at the beginning of the week, there's a narrative with this Chargers team in 2019 and one with this Packers team in 2019, and a lot of it comes down to executing, being the better team in the fourth quarter. And the Chargers, for the most part, have not been, and yeah. that is why they are three and five, and they very easily could be two and six. As I said, if that, you know, they gave up the drive that set up the field goal, they weren't getting it done when they needed to in the fourth quarter, but they caught a break. The Packers, for the most part, have been the better team in the fourth quarter this year, and that's why they're 7-1. and one. So as far as with Green Bay, that being who you are, you want to continue to be that team. What's funny to me is uh, somebody in Inbox this week brought up, he's like, well, Phillip Rivers has never won against the Packers, which technically is true. He's 0-3 against Green Bay. But he's put up a lot of yards oh, against yeah. Green Bay. Yeah. I mean, I think about that game, I think, in 2015 that they played here at Lambeau Field. Mm-hmm. I want to say he threw for, was it 480 yards or something insane it like was, that? It was over 400. I know that. He was throwing the ball all over the place. And the game out in San Diego in 2011, the Packers had built a big yeah. lead and the Chargers were coming back. It turned out to kind of be a shootout going back and forth. And um, the Chargers lost the game but still put up 34 points, and Rivers had some big numbers that day as well. Yeah, I mean, he's averaging 398 yards per game against Green Bay through the air in those three games. So you can't just look at the wins and losses and be like, okay, well, this is just going to be an easy cakewalk. (laughs) He's going to present challenges. But the point I want to get to at the end of all this is that the takeaways can be the difference maker. That can be the common denominator when it, when you're looking for a path to victory against LA and, and there's just, they've given the ball away too much and then they just haven't been able to take it away the way they have in the past few seasons. So if you, the Packers can win that area, which I want to say in what six of their eight games so far they have mm-hmm. uh, that, that is going to be a big path here for the Packers to proceed. Yeah. Well, a couple of stats and info nuggets here for you, Wes. Um, I actually looked this up just before we came into the studio. Phillip Rivers will be the first AFC quarterback to face Aaron Rodgers three times with the same team. Really? Yeah. It's never happened before, partly because of Rodgers injuries where he's missed games with Roethlisberger Roethlisberger. because, you know, because of injuries. He did face Flacco for a third time this past year, but that was once with Denver as opposed to the first two with Baltimore. So that's just kind of interesting because, because of the once every four years thing that here Rodgers and Rivers are facing off with the same teams for the third time. The other thing is, do you know how far, how far back you have to go to find a Packers game that was played in front of a crowd of roughly 30,000 people? I'm going to say 91. You're pretty close. And 88. The, there was one in the, I remember there was one in the 80s or 90s. Yeah, the, yeah. Ni- 1988, there were actually a couple of games that year. One was at uh, the Pontiac Silverdome in Detroit where the announced attendance was like 29,000 people. It was a good year like for that. the Lions. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, just kind of a, an interesting There was a there. couple that year? Like yeah, there were. were, there were I'm trying to remember now. I I, I apologize for not like writing it down. Post- I think it was against Atlanta. Was the other one that where the the announced crowd was like twenty seven, twenty nine thousand something. Was that like just that. like a so, post like like player lockout I don't, I don't, kind of lull? That's I don't, really interesting. I don't know. Yeah, it was it was odd. Yeah, Cliff um, about that. yeah the uh, the numbers there were odd. I wanted to ask you though, with regard to crowd size, wh- what do you make of uh, what we're expecting to see in terms of this invasion of the Packers fans? Because I, th- I mean, I think it's going to be a really, really unique atmosphere to have potentially a pro Packers crowd that's not at Lambeau Field. I find that really intriguing, and I'm really anxious to see what that's going to be like. But f- as far as the impact on the game, one of the points I made in Insider Inbox is that 
the Chargers know what this is like because right. earlier this year they played a primetime game in that stadium against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and that traveling contingent of Pittsburgh fans, they took over the place, right. and they made it a home game for Pittsburgh. So from the whole atmosphere and and dealing with that type of crowd situation in your own stadium, so to speak, the Chargers have dealt with this before. So from that standpoint, it's not there's not going to be some sort of a shell shock or a shock to the system in, in that respect. Yeah, so if I had my druthers here, I'd rather be in London this week. Uh, I, I wish that that would have been where the game is going to be played. So all this snow falling outside, we wouldn't have to we'll deal have to with deal it until we get back. No, but okay, so that's first and foremost, I still – think i mean man they should have played this game in london i actually even i said this on yesterday's show for the chargers sake i think it would have benefited them to have it in london i was pegging this game to be the one in london going back to like 2016 yeah. i'm like Packer, so packers at chargers in 2019 that's got to be the game that's going to london no, we're going to la going to la instead but uh that little mini lambo that's going to be over there is going to be something to be a part of because here's the thing 30,000 seats for football i think 27,000 for soccer I, being in Winnipeg this year, even though it didn't fill up, that was a 33,000-seat stadium. Okay. So it gives you sort of a little bit of a feel. I don't know where the press box is. We could be behind the outhouse for all I know. But <laughs> as far as the, the feeling of the stadium, I'm envisioning it in my mind much like Winnipeg. Yeah. And if that plays out, it's going to be a really cool environment to answer your original question. I think, I think so, it's, too going to be really fun to be a part of because it's so intimate and in this day and age and you look at college football 100,000 seat stadiums the NFL 70 80,000 seat stadiums Jerry World 93,000 or whatever right. it was for that game right you very rarely get an opportunity to play in this kind of environment uh, so I think and let me put it this way too the people that are forking over that cash uh, whether it was straight away at the ticket office or on the secondary market you got to be a pretty big fan to be able to wanting to pay that kind of you know premium, so I think it's going to be an awesome environment to be a part of. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it too. I think I mean obviously I think it's going to be a nightmare be, for the Chargers. Yeah, this will be the only the only time the Packers in their 101 year history and moving forward will play a game in this particular stadium because the next time the Packers are going to play the Chargers on the road, obviously it'll be well after the new stadium in LA is built, the one that the Rams and the Chargers are going to share eventually so eventually. this is eventually yeah supposedly allegedly <laughs> no. but yeah I think it's going to be uh, I think it's going to be fun I do want to take a look at what else is going on in week nine in the NFL though before we sign off for the week we saw a heck of a ball game last night on Thursday night football looked like the 49ers were in command they yeah. had a two score lead with about five minutes to go all of a sudden boom an 88 yard touchdown pass and the Cardinals had a couple of really, really big chances to get the ball back down the stretch. A third and 11, they gave it up. A third and nine, they gave it up. And the 49ers were able to kill those last five minutes without uh, giving the ball back to the Cardinals with just a three-point deficit. So this is what's remarkable about what the Cardinals did. And everybody wants to talk about Cliff Kingsbury and their offense. Defensively, they were pretty much the first team to solve the San Francisco run game puzzle. Now, certainly it's a little bit easier without use check in there, but it's still dynamic. Just ask my fantasy football team that had to play Tevin Coleman last week when he went <laughs> off for all those touchdowns. In this game, Tevin Coleman, 23 carries for 20, or 12 carries for 23 yards. Matthew Breida also struggling to get going. But this is where the 49ers really can be dangerous. I asked that question, I think, last week about, okay, can the 49ers win when they can't run? Now, they weren't playing from behind, per se, in this game. Right. But when they needed Jimmy Garoppolo to be the quarterback, to be the leader, to be there, the centerpiece of that offense, he came through. And as we were walking in here, I believe it was Matthew Arvin, our valued producer, who mentioned 18-2 and two now for Garoppolo as a starting quarterback. Pretty remarkable. I think that just saw the, you saw the standard in there. I thought the Cardinals played a tremendous football game I think the San Francisco 49ers are a tremendous team and when that team stays together and doesn't turn over the football even if you don't have the best aspect of your offense you're still going to find a way to victory yeah well the San Francisco 49ers are 8-0 they remain the only undefeated team in the NFC to this point looking at the NFC North interestingly as we had talked about last week the Minnesota Vikings now head to Arrowhead Stadium and to play the Kansas City Chiefs. 
one week after the Packers did. I think this is going to be a really interesting matchup. I will admit I haven't been paying attention to any of the talk of whether Mahomes is going to come back this week or if they're still sticking with Matt Moore. Have you heard anything it's on fun- what the Chiefs are doing? Uh, what is funny about this is that um, you, it's, you, last week Packer fans are all like, and I've seen it in inbox a little bit, I've seen it definitely on Twitter, Packer fans are like, how could you ever consider playing Patrick Mahomes <laughs> on nine days after this injury? Right. And then all week this week it's been, well, why isn't well, he a full participant Well, yet? come on, get out there and play. Yeah, shoot him out there. <laughs> uh, he's still limited. Uh, and at the time in which we're taping this, we still don't have an update. The reports have been that they're looking more at the Titans game okay. as far as when he's going to be back. But but it Which seems is like kind of what the original projection the was yeah. you know, anyway. So. so, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of Packer fans <laughs> that want to see Patrick Mahomes. But as my brother-in-law made me aware last week, I mean, Matt Moore, if there's any silver lining to what Kansas City did against Green Bay's defense is that Matt Moore looked fine, Uh, looked like he can handle this thing. We'll see what the Minnesota Vikings are able to come up with. But the big challenge, I think, for Minnesota in this game is they have a lot of experience. How does that match up with Kansas City's speed? Yeah. Because there's a lot of it. And this whole week is very interesting because you were just talking about why this game matters so much for, Green, for you know, I almost said San Diego, the Chargers on Sunday. I've been struggling with that all week, Be- by the way. But. Because if you win and Minnesota beats Kansas City, if if Oakland, you know, comes through or, you know, if Oakland gets beat by Detroit, however this puzzle shuffles out, the Chargers could be right back in this race. So for Kansas City, there's an urgency there. Yep. Because it's like you want to be able to maintain this lead over, I think, what a lot of people expected going into the season to be relative, you know, a, a bottom feeder in Oakland with all the, the stuff they had going on there in a team in Kansas City that you kind of had their numbers. So this is a very important week for the NFC North and for that AFC West in, in which teams could prevail and in what the byproduct and, and meaning of those games could be. Yeah, well, you mentioned Oakland is taking on the Detroit Lions. The Chicago Bears talk about heading into a gut check type of game here. They it. go to Philadelphia. The Eagles coming off of a big win on the road at Buffalo, a Buffalo team that had only lost one game until last week. The Eagles get themselves back to 500 at the midway point at 4 and 4. They're playing at home. And again, I'm sure the Eagles are looking at that win over Buffalo as this is our takeoff moment. Right. This is where we start to go. And the Bears are up against it here. They're three and four. They see where the Vikings are. They see where the Packers are. And the Bears are trying to get to that even four and four, that level spot halfway through their season to see where it goes. This is what I love about uh, <laughs> the AFC East right now. Um, Philadelphia, who just everything's been going wrong for them, uh, they go up against Buffalo and basically take it to the Bills. Oh yeah, you know, for the most part. Yeah, it kind of reminded me like when you get like those middling sort of SEC teams, and they have to take on like I don't know one of the top in the Sun Belt or something like that, <laughs> and they just they just take it to them. They get their victory. Uh, I, I think Philadelphia reminded everybody, even though they've been very up and down, and yes. they got it. If they're going to make a playoff run here, they have to be able to find some kind of winning streak. They can't be. You know, matching win for loss. Yeah, you're not going to make the playoffs in the NFC at nine and seven. No, I just don't see that happening the way things are going right now. Yeah, so I mean, this is a, a huge game for them. I mean, with where Chicago's season is headed, the issues that they're having, um, and I think the way that Philadelphia defends the run, even though David Montgomery had that big game last week, I look at this as a matchup that Philadelphia should win. And they really definitely need to win if they're going to actually keep themselves in the conversation here, not only just for playoff spots or being in the lead of the division or any of those kind of things, just to show that, okay, we're still a championship-type contender here. Yeah. We weren't, you know, sort of that that spark, that, that flash in the pan, that we can actually be a team that rises above. And for Chicago, I mean, this is the ultimate gut check because that, by, by all accounts, was their – that's the most – demoralizing loss of their season so far. Oh, and yeah. now you got to no go question. into, you know, Lincoln Financial and, and try to, you know, turn the course of your season. Yeah, around. well, it's a rematch of the NFC wild card game from a year ago God, in, wild, huh? the, in the other stadium. No and it's just interesting that obviously with the miss by Cody Parkey at the end of that game and now the Bears are going into this playoff rematch with their new kicker having just missed a field goal on the last yeah. play of the game the week before. <clears throat> so, uh a lot to try to sort out there. Anything else on the Week 9 slate you think is worth mentioning right now? I mean, there's just a total barn burner going on.
down in Miami between the Jets and the Dolphins uh, in the Adam Gase Bowl. Uh, no, uh, there, the Adam Gase Bowl. There, there's some great matchups here. Uh, there's this storyline now that's developing with the Jaguars where, you know, Nick Foles could potentially be back here soon. Yeah. Gardner Minshew has been not only a really good quarterback, but as I was looking at one of the things that ESPN brought up, I mean, he's been one of the top rookies uh, so far this season. You can make an argument he's had a better rookie season to this point than Kyler Murray. So they're going to have to make a decision there, and they have a tough opponent coming in in the Houston Texans. But realistically, Mike, we've talked week in and week out. We've written about it numerous times. The New England Patriots have not been tested. Well, now they get tested. Yeah, They go into Baltimore. They take on that defense. First off, can Tom Brady, who's been you know, kind of in this game manager sort of role now, can he – get this offense moving, and can that New or- New England Patriots defense that has been so stout step up to the challenge of Lamar Jackson? We're probably not going to be able to watch this game. Yeah, unfortunately. I wish I could because be I, I think it's going to be a really interesting contrast in football styles and seeing if the way that the Baltimore Ravens play right now, run heavy, athletic, solid special teams – a sneaky good defense, if that can match up with the very best in the AFC right now. Yeah, and a lot of people looking at that game, Patriots against the Ravens as a potential preview of a of a January rematch between uh, between those two teams down the road. So, you can make a case, Mike, if you go back to last December, that there's no hotter team in football than the Baltimore Ravens. Even though, yeah. you know, San Francisco's been on the run they've been on this season. If you count that, I mean, the Ravens had a run the table esque kind of run at the end of last season yeah they did with the only interruption being that loss in overtime to kansas city if you partner that together with this way that they got off to this season i mean you got to tip your cap to john harbaugh because they they things weren't looking good there for a minute but they got sort of this influx of momentum and swagger from that move to, to lamar jackson and and here we are. I think they're one of those teams that uh, when you're talking about just a regular seven-day, one-week preparation, they're a preparation challenge. Because, Nightmare. Because Lamar Jackson and the way that offense runs is just so different. It's so it's so non-traditional for, from what 2019 NFL football is. And, and it is. It's, it's going to be a great matchup because the Patriots, statistically and what we've seen on the field, regardless of who their opponents have been, They've been uh, a, an incredibly stout defense, very, very difficult for anybody to score against. And I would make an argument too, Mike, that the Baltimore Ravens, more than maybe any other team in the NFL right now, are as dangerous if they end up getting a bye. If you give John Harbaugh that extra week to work with, to prepare, and then teams having to focus on a wild card opponent and then taking right. on the Ravens, yes. which is how Absolutely. different they are and how different <clears throat> they play. I think one of the things that worked against them was working into that hole at the beginning of last season, having to make a run to get a wild card spot. Right. That ultimately is, I think, why their their car ran out of gas. But man, if they can be in position, I'm sure you're gonna have to just might as well sharpie in. You know, the Patriots for one of those two buys in the AFC, but right. the Ravens and then the where Kansas City's at right now, Ravens can make a real run at, at being that number two seed. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch. With that, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team and especially Sunday afternoon's game from Los Angeles. We'll have it all for you on Packers.com. Subscribe to us, like us on iTunes and other podcast services. On Twitter, he's at Wes Hot. I'm at Mike Spofford at Packers for the team account. Thanks for tuning in everybody. See you next time. Oh yeah. Young Moolah baby.